Hello, and welcome to this session on ensuring safety and consistency in the age of machine learning with Chong Li Tin. Following a 10 minute talk by Chong Li, we'll move on to a live Q&A session in which she will respond to your questions. You can submit questions in your name or anonymously using the box on the right hand side of this video. You can also vote for your favorite questions to push them higher up in the queue. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Then after 20 minutes of questions, I'll bring the Q&A to an end. But that's not the end of the session. To help you think through and apply the ideas you've heard, I'll be asking you to join a 20 minute icebreaker session where you will have two speed meetings with other attendees to discuss your thoughts on the content. I'll explain how to do that when we get there. But now I would like to introduce our speaker for this session. Chong Li Tin is a research scientist at DeepMind. Her primary interest is in building safer, more reliable, and more trustworthy machine learning algorithms. Over the past few years, she has contributed to developing algorithms to make neural networks more robust to noise. Key parts of her research focus on functional analysis, properties of neural networks that can naturally enhance robustness. Prior to DeepMind, Chong Li studied at Cambridge. Her PhD is in bioinformatics. Here's Chong Li. Hi, my name is Chong Li Chen. I'm a research scientist at DeepMind, where my primary focus is looking at robust and verified machine learning algorithms. So today my talk is on ensuring safety and consistency in the age of machine learning. So with all of the great research which has happened over the past several decades, machine learning algorithms are becoming increasingly more powerful. There has been several breakthroughs, many breakthroughs, sorry, in this field, and today I just want to mention a few. So one of the earlier breakthroughs was using convolutional neural networks to boost the accuracy of image classifiers. More recently, we've seen generative models that is now capable of generating images with high fidelity and realism. We've also been making breakthroughs in biology where now machine learning can fold proteins to unprecedented level of accuracy. We can also use machine learning and reinforcement learning algorithms um, to beat um, humans in games such as Go. More recently, we've seen machine learning pushing the boundaries of language. Um, so the recent GPT-2 and 3 models have demonstrated they're no, not only capable of generating text that is grammatically correct, um, but really grounded in the real world. So as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. As our machine learning algorithms become increasingly more powerful, it is now more important than ever for us to understand what might be the negative impacts and risks of all of this. And more importantly, what can we do to mitigate for these risks? So to highlight why we need to start thinking about these risks, I want to give a few motivating examples, starting with this one here. So this is a paper published in 2013 titled Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks. What they have discovered is that you can take a state-of-the-art image classifier and you can put an image through it. So in this case, it's an image of a panda. And indeed, we can correctly classify this as a panda. So what happens if you take the exact same image, add on a carefully chosen perturbation that is so small that the newly perturbed image looks almost exactly the same as the original image? Well, we would kind of expect the neural network to behave in a very similar way. But in fact, when you put this newly perturbed image through the neural network, it is now almost 100% confident that this is a given. So in this instance, maybe misclassifying a panda for a given might not have too many consequences. However, we can actually choose the perturbation to make the neural network output whatever it is that we want. For example, we can output a bird or a vehicle. If such a classifier was used for systems like autonomous driving, this can have catastrophic consequences. You can actually also discover something called adversari universal adversarial perturbations, which are perturbations that is um, image agnostic. So here is an example of such a perturbation. This is one single perturbation that you can add to all of these images. 
and then more often than not, um, flips the output of your neural network. Some of the failure modes of machine learning can be slightly more subtle. So here in this paper titled, The Woman Worked as a Babysitter on Biases in Language Generation, um, what they did was a systematic, a systematic study on um, how the GPT-2 language model behaved conditioned on different demographic groups. So for example, what happens if you change the prompt from the man worked as to the woman worked as? Well, the subsequent generated text changes quite drastically in flavor and is often heavily prejudiced. Similarly, for the black man worked as to the white man worked as. And I want everyone to take a few seconds to read the generated text as we change the subject of the prompt. As you can see, although this model is very powerful, it definitely carries some of the biases that we have in society today. And if this is the model that is used for something like auto-completion of text, this can further feed and exacerbate the biases that we may already have. So with all of these risks, we need to think about what can we do to enable our machine learning algorithms to be safe, reliable, and trustworthy. Well, maybe one step towards the right direction is ensuring our machine learning algorithms satisfy desirable specifications. That is to say, we have a certain level of quality control over these algorithms. For example, for an image classifier, we want it to be robust to adversarial perturbations. For a dynamical systems predictor, we would like it to satisfy the laws of physics. We would like our classifier to be robust to changes that is irrelevant for prediction. For example, the color of your digit should not affect your digit classification. If we're training on sensitive data, we want it to maintain a level of differential privacy. These are just a few of many examples of desirable specifications that we need our classifier to satisfy. So here I want to introduce specification-driven machine learning. So what do I mean by specification-driven machine learning? Well, the core issue lies in the fact when we're training with limited data, our models can learn a lot of spurious correlations to boost the metrics. So what this means is that your model is ultimately hinged on the data and the metric. And unless we design our training carefully, your model can inherit a lot of the undesirable properties in your data, unless you specify otherwise. For example, in this case, if your data is biased and limited, then your models will also be non-robust and biased. So in specification-driven ML, we want to enforce the specifications that may or may not be present in your data, but essential for, a, for your systems to be reliable. So I want to give some examples of how we can train neural networks um, to satisfy specifications. Um, starting with this example here. That is for your image classifiers to be robust adversarial perturbations. One of the most commonly used methodologies to train your neural networks to be robust to these perturbations is something called adversarial training. So I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail. This is actually very similar to standard image classification training, where we optimize the weight of our neural network to correctly label an image. For example, in this case, the image is of a cat, so we want the output of the neural network um, to predict a cat as well. What adversarial training is, is simply this with an extra data augmentation step, where we say, yes, we want the original image to be rightfully predicted as a cat, but under any additive imperceptible perturbations, we want all of these images to be correctly classified as a cat as well. But we note actually it is computationally infeasible to iterate through all of these changes. Um, what adversarial training cleverly does is that it tries to find the worst case perturbation, which is the perturbation that actually minimizes the probability of the cat. Once you have found this worst case perturbation, now you simply feed this back into the training loop like this and you re reiterate. And this methodology has shown 
to be at least empirically robust to these adversarial perturbations. But we want our neural networks to not only be robust to these small perturbations, we want them to be robust to semantic changes or changes to our images that should not actually affect our prediction. For example, the skin tone of a person should not affect a classifier um, that distinguishes between smiling or non-smiling. And actually, in order for us to train our neural networks to be robust to these semantic changes, require a very simple change to adversarial training. So here, rather than considering the worst case perturbation, we can simply consider the worst case semantic perturbation. And through the developments of generative modeling, we can use generative models to generate these semantic perturbations. And using this methodology, we can now actually reduce the gap in accuracy between two groups based on skin tone from 33% down to just 3.8%, mitigating the bias that was originally present in the data. So of course, the things I have touched on today um, definitely enhances specification satisfaction to some extent, but there are still problems, still a lot of problems to be solved. For example, there is just two specifications I have mentioned today. There are many more specifications that we would like our neural networks to satisfy. And the more complex this, these specifications become, the harder the problems become. And even on this standard image classification example of training our neural networks to be robust to these perturbations, we still have yet to find a single classifier that is robust to these perturbations completely. But if we do get this right, with this, we can bring many more opportunities. We can enable safe, reliable, autonomous driving systems, more robust ways of forecasting weather. We can help the speech impaired with more robust audio synthesis. The possibilities are endless. So with this, um, I hope I have motivated you into thinking about these problems and I'll conclude my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the talk, Chongli. I see we've had um, a number of questions submitted already. So let's mm -hmm. kick off with the first one. So what, what are the biggest factors holding back the impact of machine learning for the life sciences, do you think? So I think it definitely comes into um, quality control. So I think machine learning has pushed the boundaries in terms of a lot of the metrics that we care about, but uh, in terms of the metrics, they are not the only things that we care about. We definitely also care about, do they satisfy the right specifications? For example, for image classification, are they robust to be used for self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. If we're using it for, say, like a medical application, we need to make sure that actually it satisfies um, certain uncertainty principles. So for example, if you give it inputs that's out of distribution, you want to make sure that your neural network reflects this correctly. Um, so I think, yeah, this might, this is definitely one of the biggest factors holding it back. Great. Thank you so much for that. I think the next question we have, um, so what gives you confidence that, um, DeepMind's machine learning technology will be used by third parties according to the safety and consistency principles that you advocate for? So I'm very confident about this because, um, I'm part of a team in deep mind where this is our sole fo fo focus. So basically our purpose is to ensure all of the algorithms that deep mind deploy or will deploy um, goes through certain specification checks. And this is very important to us. So I am very confident on this because this is something I'm directly working on. Um, so yes. even when it comes to the third party use, right? Uh, what do you mean by the third party use? So when they deploy um, DeepMind's machine learning technology, that they, that is in accordance with the principles that you set out. Uh, yes, 
Well, yeah. it depends on the application. So obviously, this is still like humanly designed. So um, depends on the applications that we are considering. We first need to think about what specifications do we want it to satisfy. And then um, it goes through some rigorous tests to make sure that it actually does. And yes. Thanks does that question. answer your question? I think so. I'm. I'm. I want to ask this. Uh, this person who asked this question, what they what they mean in the context of third party use, but perhaps that can be taken up over Slack. Uh, yes. So yeah. For now, we'll move on to next question. So, I think Alexander asked, "How tractable do you perceive the technological aspects of machine learning alignment to be compared to the social aspects?" In by this question, do we mean like the value alignment, the yeah, the so. ethics, the ethical risks, and things like this? So, um, my talk was specifically based on like the technological side of things, but I think like for the ethical side of things, for example, if we're using, how, are we making sure that machine learning is being used for good? For example, we don't want it to be used for weapons, um, things like this. Uh, that has a uh, less technological aspect to it. We should think about this in terms of deployment, in terms of how we design our algorithms. Um, but yes, this is definitely something that people should be thinking about. Thank you, Chongli. Next question. What can AI or machine learning researchers learn from the humanities for reducing the discrimination embedded in current models? Oh, that's an interesting question. What can we learn from the... I think one thing um, that I often think about is, for example, echo chamber effects. So for example, if you're going on Facebook and Facebook detects that you like certain kind of feeds and it will feed you more of these sort of feeds, and it has this echo chamber effect where the things that you like will be feed to you. Whereas we actually want to make sure that we have a diverse set of opinions that doesn't focus on a particular bias. Um, so for example, something like this makes me think about how can we design our ranking algorithms to make sure that um, this sort of effects doesn't happen. Um, yeah, so that's definitely something that I, I think about. Great. So it's Could kind of like, it's kind of like applying a sociological concept of echo chambers to assess you know, the performance or... The so in that, be, in that yeah. sense, I think definitely we would be thinking about like, we would be learning from um, humanity. Um, how do humans react in terms of this? And uh, is it good? Is it bad? And how can we design our algorithms to make sure that we enhance the good and alleviate the bad? We have to take that from social sciences. Great. Yeah, I believe that answers the questions very well. I mean, I also think in terms of value alignment, I think that's quite important. For example, if we're designing agents or if we're designing reinforcement learning algorithms, we want to make sure that it satisfies certain values that humans stand for or principles that humans stand for. So this is, yes. So yes, yeah, I would say social science is very important. Absolutely. I think related to that point, um, do you think regulation is needed to ensure that very powerful current machine learning is aligned with the beneficial societal values. Yes, Regula re regulation is very, very important. The reason why I say this is, um, I think everyone has seen this in the talk, you can have a state of the arts classifier that beats um, a lot of the metrics that we care about and still behaves in very, very unexpected ways. So given this sort of behavior, we need regulations. We need to make sure that certain specifications are satisfied. Um, so yes, I think this is highly important. Thank you for that. So for the next question, um, what uses is machine learning already being implemented for where these biases could be creating a huge undervalued issue? So, I'm not so sure I have any, like, uh, all I can say is that um, machine learning is becoming more and more prevalent in society and it's being used in more and more applications. There's not a single application where maybe machine learning hasn't had a too, like a, at least a little impact on. So I think um, 
I think the example I which I mentioned in the talk is something that I think is quite important. For example, in terms of language modeling, because language is quite a subtle um, propagator of bias. And we want to make sure that our languages that is through machine learned models doesn't carry these sort of biases. So I think I can, I can mention some applications which I think is important for us to be extremely bias free. And this is definitely something I think is quite important. Would you like to share any examples on that? So, oh, I thought I already shared one, which is the language modeling. Right, but another right. would be, for example, in medical domains. So I think in medical domains, if you suppose you're collecting data and uh, it's heavily from maybe one population rather than other, we need to make sure that our machine learning algorithms do doesn't reflect this kind of bias because we want healthcare to be equal for all. Um, so that's another application which I think this is quite important. Great, thank you for that. So next question, um, what do you think are the key changes needed to ensure aligned AI? If you consider that current engagement optimization might already be very bad for society. I want to be very specific about this. So I don't think I don't think metric design is, is bad for society. I think the key here is n knowing that our metrics are will always be flawed. And that's the key. Like we can always be thinking about designing better metrics. So it's not a, um, a huge breakthrough. It's an evolution. So you train a, you train your cl a classifier for, image, for images, and then you realize, um, oh, this metric doesn't capture the robustness property. So you add this back into the metric. And then you retrain. And then you suddenly find, oh, maybe it doesn't satisfy distribution shift. And then we retrain. This is a progression. But the thing we need to realize is that metrics doesn't capture everything we want it to have. And we just need to keep that in the back of my, our mind and always make sure that we're rigorously testing our systems. And I think that's a very, very um, paradigm shifting idea where we need to think about our metrics might be flawed and guessing state of the art is not what we, we're here to do. We're here to deliver safe algorithms. Um, and I think that's, that's the key idea. Great, thanks for reinforcing that. Next question, how much more important is it to focus on long-term AI risk versus near-term or medium-term risk, in your opinion? Um, sorry, my, my computer just, uh, OK, so now it's back on. Um, uh, that's a really interesting question, because from my perspective, I think both have different advantages. Uh, what I mean by this is for the short term, I, I know exactly what the problem is. The problem is concrete. And from having this problem being concrete, I can also tackle this more concretely. I can think about uh, the problem in terms of how, how, what the formulas look like, um, what, I, what I can do to make sure that we train our neural networks so that satisfy certain specifications. But then in terms of long term, it goes back to what you mentioned before, which is value alignments, or ethical risks, or um, maybe there are some things that we haven't even discovered yet, which can affect our algorithms in a completely unexpected way. Um, this goes into like a more philosophical view of how we should be thinking about this. And I think um, we can definitely take our values from both. But because from my perspective, I'm more um, technologically driven in terms of design, I think more about the near term. So I can only answer in terms of, I think I see in the near term, if we want autonomous driving systems to happen, that we need to make sure that our classifiers are robust. That's a very easy question to answer. But then at a much, much longer term, I can't, my, my imagination fails me. And sometimes I fail to think of like, what might have to happen here, what might happen there. And yeah, but I think that is not to say that is not important. That is also equally important, but I might have less um, professional opinions on this. Right, that's very fair, thank you. Yeah. On the next question, out of all the approaches to AI safety by different groups and organizations, which is closest to DeepMind's, in your opinion, besides DeepMind's own approach, of course? 
I'm not so sure that we even have a pro and one approach. We're just a bunch of researchers. I'm sure in lots of other organizations, uh, there are also a bunch of researchers looking at similar problems and thinking about similar questions. Um, I mean, I guess like the way I can only talk about how I think my group tackles this. So we're very mission driven. So um, we really want to ensure that our algorithms that we deliver is safe, reliable and trustworthy. So from our from our perspective, that is how we think about our research. But I cannot make any comments on any other organizations because I don't actually know how they how, how they work. Um, yeah. Great. Does Thank that you. answer the question? OK. So this next one is on Phi, from Phi, sorry. So do you think there is a possibility that concerns and research on AI safety and ethics will eventually expand to the direct or indirect impacts on animals? Direct or indirect impacts on animals. I mean, I guess I'm not, I don't know that much about animal conservation, but I can imagine um, because machine learning algorithms are so pervasive, it's definitely going to have an impact. And, um, and touching on everything I've said before, um, if you want to alleviate certain biases in that sort of area, we need to also think about designing our metrics carefully. So I don't know much about that area, so I don't know what, they, what it is that they normally train for and how they design their training. But all I can say is that we need to think about it carefully. You want to think about what it is that you want to avoid when it comes yeah. to animal conservation uh, machine learning algorithms. Right. That's, yeah. Thanks for that. Are there ways to deliberately counter adversarial training and other types of perturbation mitigations? Deliberately counter adversarial training. Yeah. So what does that mean? Because adversarial training is a process. Um, what, what, do we, what do they mean by countering it? Hmm. How hard for me to unpick this one because I'm just reading off the slide. slide over, but, um, mm. Could you read the question again? Yeah. Are there ways to deliberately counter uh, adversarial training and other types of perturbation uh, mitigation? So I think I'm, I'm just going to answer what I think this question is asking, yeah. um, which is uh, suppose if I train a neural network with adversarial training, um, can I still attack the system knowing that this is trained adversarially maybe? Um, and I think one of the things that I didn't touch on quite for this presentation, because I, I wasn't sure how much detail I want to go into this, is that um, specification-driven machine learning evaluation is extremely important. So we need to make sure that, um, suppose we, we do adversarial training. When we're evaluating, we're going to be evaluating more than just a, like a simple um, adversary in the mix. We're going to be looking at all sorts of different other properties about the neural networks to ensure that whatever it is we deliver, maybe a stronger attacker will come through and they will still, we will still be robust to this. So I think the answer to that question is that we need to design our systems to be extremely rigorously tested, um, more so than our training procedure. Does that, I hope that answers whoever asked, asked this question. I think that touches on aspects of it, at least. What, what other that. aspects, what other aspects do you think I think, yeah, we should, we should, you know, clarify the context of this question on, or the scenario that's being imagined perhaps on the side. Yeah. 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 Let's do that. Yep. Let me find the next question. Well, here's, here's from Pooja. What do you use for interpretability and fairness? Um, there is not a sing one single algorithm that we use. These are still like being developed. So like I said, I'm not an ethical scientist. I think in terms of fairness, there is a lot of different metrics regarding fairness. Fairness is not something that's easily, actually very easily defined. So when it comes to training algorithms to be fair, we assume that we have a fairness definition from 
someone who, who knows more about this stuff. And then we try to satisfy this specification. But I think designing metrics that are more aligned with fairness, that's where the difficult challenges come in. Um, what was the other one they mentioned? There was fairness and there was something else. Interpretability. Interpretability. Yeah. So I, could you repeat the question again? What, what do you use for interpretability and fairness? So again, I think interpretability is not, there's not a single algorithm that we use for interpretability. And it actually depends on the applications that we probably would eventually use it for. How we can design um, our neural networks to be interpretable um, is completely dependent on that. Um, yes, so yeah, I, I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, um, I think so. It's rather broad, I guess. Yeah. For, for this next one. Um, so assuming only the current state of AI capability, what is the most malicious outcome a motivated individual group or organization could achieve? Ooh. So I think what is the most malicious? Again, I'm not so sure there is a single one. So something which I, I think is quite important right now is differentially private um, neural networks. Because suppose if we're training on quite sensitive data and we want to make sure that the people's data is protected and is still anonymized, and we don't want any um, uh, malicious attackers who's interested in knowing more about these people to come in and just look at these neural networks Works and say, oh, we know more about someone, someone, and so and so. So um, I would say that's possibly a very important um, area that people should be looking at. And from in my, at least in my opinion, is it, it would be it's uh, very malicious. Um, yeah. So I think that's just off the top of my head, but there's obviously a lot, a lot more. Um, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So, again, a rather broad question, but do you have a field in mind where you would like to see machine learning being applied more? Do I have a field in? Actually, um, Nigel, we have talked about this um, earlier, which is yeah. um, in terms of resource allocations for charities, I feel like there's a lot of data, and I feel like machine learning definitely can contribute a lot more in that area. Um, yeah, so that's something I would really like to see machine learning make a larger contribution in. Um, or making sure that the charity's data is formatted in a way that's easily trainable, that um, allows more interesting research questions to be, to be asked and answered. Um, sorry, my computer keeps on blacking out. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, so definitely, I think, analyzing data from charities to make sure that we're allocating the right resources um, more effectively. Um, because if people are donating money, they want to make sure that their money is donated effectively. And I think this is something definitely machine learning can make a lot more impact in. Great. Thank you. So the next question. Is it fair to say that biases targeted in neural networks are ones that humans are aware of? Is there possibility of machine aware bias recognition? Uh, it would be hard to make machines aware unless you drive it into the metric. Um, could you just repeat that question again? Yeah. So is it fair to say that biases targeted in neural networks are ones that humans are aware of? Is there a possibility of machine I'm, aware I'm not so bias sure that's so I'm not so sure that's fair because my because from my opinion, most um, machine learning researchers just handle a data set and um, they don't know the properties about this data set and they just want to see, oh, we want the accuracy to be higher or we want this to be higher. But the biases that's present in the data set, maybe from some kind of data collection scheme, um, will be transferred in the model until you specify otherwise. But would you say the human is aware of this bias? I, I don't think so. Um, right. That is not to say that maybe some humans 
are not, like maybe they are, but I would say for the majority of cases, um, yeah, it's we just need to be a, from that question. I think the real answer should be looking at um, if we're looking at the data, we should first inspect um, what might be the undesirable things that's present in this data and how can we alleviate this. Great. The next question. Um, how much model testing should be considered sufficient before deployment, given possible unexpected behavior of even well-studied models and unknown unknowns? I feel like there are several testing stages. So the first testing stages is the necessary condition conditions that we already know. Um, for example, the image classifiers for autonomous driving systems, we know need, it needs to be robust. Um, and then the second stage comes in, maybe we can put these out in a small scale deployment, and then they will report us back, oh, we discovered all of these kinds of problems. And then from these set of problems, we can design a new set of specifications. And this is an iterative process rather than like just one set of specifications go sort of process. This definitely requires heavy testing, um, both at the conception stage and also small deployment stage. So in terms of deployment design. Um, definitely, I think that's very important. Do you think there's a way to, well, I think just building on that question, is there a way to decide that testing is sufficient before deployment? What, what would you say are the key indicators of that? So I think one of the things I just mentioned was we would never know before deployment. So what mm -hmm. we can do is we can deploy on a smaller scale yeah. and to ensure that the risks are being minimized. And if things work out or there is a certain specification that we realize still needs to be satisfied, then we go through a second stage. And then maybe we can go for a slightly larger scale deployment and, and so yeah. on. So basically the key to that question is we can never truly know before deployment, which is why we need a small scale deployment to make sure that we understand what are the problems that can exist. Um, but before deployment, we can only know the things that we, we can envision, um, which is our oh, robustness to perturbations, we want it to be di differentially private, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Thank you for that. Next question. How can we discuss um, AI or machine learning concerns with people desperate for quick solutions? For example, farmers using machine learning in agriculture because of their anxiety about climate change? Farmers because of their anxiety. I think it depends on what you mean by quick. Yeah. Um, even when it comes to climate change, I think we're probably looking at um, solutions that will take maybe one year or two years to fully understand and deploy. I believe if we do anything in too much of a hurry, things will might go go wrong or it might not have the intended effect that you will have. So even if this farmer is anxious, um, I think it is still really important to make sure that these systems are rigorously tested. Uh, so in my opinion, we should not, like time is of the essence, but we should not rush it. Um, Great. I think we have time for just a few more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this one may be second to the last. How do you distinguish between semantic differences and content differences in photos? Is this possible to do automatically for a large data set? Uh, content differences and semantic differences. Um, I think given a relatively good generative model, it depends on what you mean by um, can you distinguish? Because I'm sure like to some level, to some extent, um, if we're using a good generative model, it can distinguish some of the times, maybe not other times. Um, but to fully distinguish, like using a generative model, I would say maybe we're not quite there yet. Um, I think that answers semantic, but in terms of content, do they mean, can they identify this image to be a banana or something like this? Yeah, perhaps. You know, kind of. Um, could you repeat the question again? Sorry. Yeah. How do you distinguish between semantic differences and content differences? So, 
in terms of photos in the context of oh i see i think i see what they mean so yeah. here when i say semantic differences i really mean uh features which should not affect your prediction so this is um exactly as uh, maybe this question is alluding to this is actually a quite a nuanced point it's very it's very difficult to say um uh, what should or should not affect our prediction um but we can actually start from toy examples that we know of for example when it comes to if we want to have digit that's a, a data set in machine learning called mnist digits and um, or colored mnist which is basically an image of a digit and you can have like colors inside this and for, for this simple task we know for sure that the color of your mnist of your digit should not affect its prediction so we say this is a semantic perturbation if you change the color. Um, but of course, if you move to more complex data sets, this becomes more and more difficult to, to, to settle down, to, to, to actually understand. So we can use actually generative models to um, approximate, but it should never, we would never know for sure. But this needs more areas of research, of course. Thank you for that. So maybe we have time just for just one last question to round out mm. the discussion. Outside of DeepMind, where do you think the most promising research in AI safety is being done? Oh, that's a that's a difficult question because I feel like there has there's a lot of um, great research that's happening out there, and I I would not know all of them. Like just in my uh, limited view, I can see that there are some very very good research happening at uh, at Google, OpenAI, at um, Stanford, at uh, Berkeley. There's a lot of, I mean, there's not a single one. Everyone's contributing to the same cause. And I think, I, I also don't think it's fair to measure research and because I think we're all trying to achieve the same things. Um, so yeah, I think anyone who's touching on AI safety should be commended and they're all doing good work, I think. That's a great note to end the Q&A session on. Thank you, okay. Chong Li. Thank you, But Nigel. don't go away just yet um, for the audience. Um, discussing new ideas with other people can be a really good way to understand them. So we're going to use the last 20 minutes of this session for a couple of short speed meetings with other attendees. If you check the session description below this video, you'll find a link to an icebreaker session where we're going together for those meetings. So please click on that link now, and a new host will meet you on the other side. Thanks for watching. Thank you.